Um, so I'm going to introduce you quickly. Hello, first of all. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. That was a slightly creepy hello from Jono, but he's special <laughs> ops at Yoast, uh, an incredibly groovy guy. And I was looking at your Days of the Year site earlier on, and apparently it's Active Dog Month, and yet it's Stationary <laughs> Week. Isn't that brilliant? I think it's also Tea Day today. Yep. I just like to, it's active dog, but stationary week. Anyway, um, your site's great. I love it. I keep going to it and, and deciding what kind of day it is today. And you were saying on the chat that it's wine day. No, is it? Well, it, we were just saying it's like, it's, it's so unclear what day of the week it is and whether or not you're allowed to start drinking yet. It's always so, wine day. Yeah, yeah. I'm with Lily. Every day is wine day. And I'm British, so every, every day, day is tea day too. <laughs> Yep. Brilliant. Well, welcome. We're going to be talking in a moment. Jana's going to be picking this up. Lily, Lily Ray, we've met a few times. A few uh, times. You're from Path Interactive. You work with Path Interactive in New York. Yes, indeed. And Thanks I saw that me. you were a drummer for two seconds. Hmm. Where'd you see Only that? Only two seconds. Was it in the knowledge graph? No, it's in LinkedIn. <laughs> you, you said drummer for two seconds. I thought that was a great sentence. But I think two seconds was the name of the group. That's true. That was one of my bands for sure. Great. So you're a musician, DJ, and eat expert. Mm, I guess so. Brilliant Thanks for stuff. having me. It's a pleasure. Um, Andrew, you run Optimizee. You've just gone freelance or you've just left your real job, which was, I now <laughs> discover, Royal Society of Chemistry. Yeah, what a great time to launch your own company, huh? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, <laughs> and do you miss the Royal Society of Chemistry? Of course. So they might be listening, so I have to say yes. Brilliant stuff. Okay, well, we've introduced everybody. Uh, we've looked at what is EAT, why it's important. We've looked at what to do with your content. Now we're going to look at the, the Cody part, how to do your schema markup, your structured data to push that out and really big yourself up, as Jennifer was saying at the beginning. Um, and after that, we're going to, as I said, for the last part, Nick's going to come back and we're going to look at uh, structuring, organizing your actual EAT work, measuring it and visualizing it, which is going to be really cool, uh, but not as cool as this because Jono is giving the presentation <laughs> and he's wonderful. Excellent. Off you so go, well. Jono. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Lovely. Groovy, in fact. Also, can I compliment you on how well you've organized your shelves, seeing as you you pick up on my, my chaotic um, room every time we do a webinar? You've, you've yeah. made an effort to tidy. This is great. Yeah, well, I looked at your background, which you've blurred, I noticed. And I, yeah, I, I haven't tidied up. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I tidied up and left it um, clear. Nice. OK, let's jump in. Um, I don't know how much we need to go through this, because Lauren Baker, who was on um, just a few minutes ago from Search Engine Journal, talked um, really eloquently about some of the things that they've done with um, things like um, writer profiles and connecting people's information to their alumni info and where they went to school and what their qualifications are. And that's certainly something we should look at. Um, but yeah, he covered a lot of the, the kind of more interesting stuff. So we're going to we're going to struggle through regardless and see if we can pave some new territory. So what is the relationships between schema and EAT? Let's dive in. Um, I would like you to think about Wikipedia. Um, because it has a kind of special place when it comes to the world of SEO. It's generally considered to be the authority when it comes to websites and content and pages. Its articles are more or less the most authoritative articles on any given topic. And if you put aside for a moment some of the issues they have with editorial processes and politics, their articles are generally the most trustworthy. And the content in the most part is written and edited and maintained by some of the foremost experts on those topics in those fields which means altogether that Google uses it as a resource. And it means that we as SEOs and marketers and PRs and brand managers and consumers value it, and in particular, from an SEO perspective, value links from it. So if we're gonna be talking about EAT and the world of structured data, there are few examples as good as Wikipedia. We often think about it as the king of websites. I wanna challenge that thinking. What if Wikipedia isn't special at all? What if it has no special place in Google's algorithm? No magical specialness in its links or citations? What if it's just another website? What if it's as well regarded as it is, not because of some indefinable differentness, but just because it's full of expertly written, authoritative, and trustworthy content? 
OK, you could argue perhaps that that's the case for many websites, maybe even your own company website. It probably has some of those attributes, but it doesn't get as much traffic or exposure as Wikipedia does. So what makes Wikipedia different? Aside from the fact that they've been around for a while and built up a competitive moat and got velocity, what makes them special? And what can we learn from that that you can take and apply to your own site, which in all likelihood probably hasn't built up as much of the cultural awareness and velocity that Wikipedia has? How do you achieve that same level of trustworthiness and specialness? The thing that makes Wikipedia different, I think, is how it's structured. They don't just have a top navigation full of links which sends you to categories which you have to wade through and work out which are the things they show you you want to look for. They don't have reams and reams of paginated blog posts going back into years and years of products which you and search engines have to crawl through to find the thing they're looking for. What they do have is a web of interconnected content which cross-references everything everywhere, all of which is written by trusted expert authors. That's an implicit authoritative knowledge graph, which means that if they, are to, if they add a new article about, say, me, it can be easily connected to content about SEO, digital marketing, ginger hair, Britain, wine, and other things I'm connected to. And now each page and that page is a node in a web of expertise, not just an article on a website, which means that every article they add at that level of quality makes the whole site more useful, more relevant, and more structured. It is critically a resource and not just a web page. And because it's connected to and from those other concepts, it's intrinsically more authoritative and more trustworthy. Imagine if your website had that kind of structure, if your content was a web of things that Google could understand. Let's be practical. You're never going to have millions of pages on your website like Wikipedia. You're never going to interconnect your article about green widgets to one about particle physics because you don't have the breadth or depth of content. And if you do have that kind of scale, millions of pages, and chances are you probably have problems with their expertise and their trustworthiness. They're probably not expertly written. But what you can do is describe the things on your website in the same way as Wikipedia structures its articles. You can connect the information about the product you sell to the company who sells it, to information about who wrote your content, to that person's own websites and Twitter profiles, and so on. What you can do is use structured data on your pages to describe the content, the entities you reference, and critically, their relationships to each other. Now, here's the key. I want you to start to think, how would I structure my website's content and its data as if it were pages on Wikipedia? Think about when Wikipedia uses internal links to cross-reference entities. It doesn't do it every time. It doesn't never do it. It does it with a strict set of rules and guidelines which add value to the user, which connect concepts and pages. Think about how they add detailed data, facts and figures in those side tables we're all familiar with, which quickly answer the key questions and expose key answers which people want just at a glance, which solve for simple problems. Think about how they compete and win by having and exposing data in those tables that nobody else has, that they performed original research to go and create. And think about how all of this content and all of this data has its own metadata when it was created, when it was last updated, who added it, who edited it, the word count, the estimated reading time, the language it's in, and a thousand other things. Think about how they structure the content with clear sections and a progression in the complexity of storytelling. And think about how they use, and not only use, but need citations to prove the expertise, the authority, and the trustworthiness of any claims that they make or cite. Think about how they're expertly reviewed and challenged critically and continually refined and updated over time. There's no reason why you can't do all of this with your content and your pages in your website in structured data. That's how we achieve expertise, authority, and trust. We emulate what Wikipedia do with their pages. You do that, yay, with schema.org markup, everybody's favorite. There's been a lot of people talking on and about this this evening, so we won't drag on in too much depth. But if you're not familiar, um, the short story is go to schema.org. Um, in 2011, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, who remembers any of those, got together and launched this site. It's a standard way of describing things. It defines methods and code which people can use to describe and structure their content. 
to give you an example, imagine a product. It has attributes like a cost and maybe reviews. And each of those reviews has properties like star ratings and an author. And that author has a name and an email address and other properties connected to other properties. If I can make sure that my product content and my page and my template is implemented using schema.org markup, you can see an example in the slide, then Google can not just scrape the page, but start to understand that information and consume it more easily. And they can use that in featured snippets, in building relationships, and in understanding who that content might be a good fit for. I've stolen this from um, Lily's search engine journal article. I don't know if that's come live yet. Not for me. If that's come live, I missed it. No, in Lily's <laughs> upcoming search engine journal article, and um, she writes a point where she says that in Google's own words, providing this markup helps them by providing explicit clues about the meaning of a page, and that Google uses that to understand the content of the page as well as to gather information about the web and the world in general. Think about how much more profound that is than Google scrapes the words from your page and tries to guess what they're about. They use it to understand the web and the world. But whilst product schema is shiny and exciting and a good example, it's worth considering there is much, much more going on than that. Think about the pages on your site. Every single one of them is probably about a thing. And it was written by a person and it maybe mentions a couple of topics and other things and features images and videos all of which have their own properties all of which connect to that wider world we can describe those kinds of entities and relationships not just our products and our services very few people do describe that kind of information in depth or well and that's i think at least in part because most of the tools which people use to author their structured data sadly aren't very sophisticated this is a screenshot from a WordPress plugin. Don't worry, it's not Yoast. Um, there are lots like this. And this is the kind of approach used in most content management systems. Here, I'm editing a page or a blog post, and I can select what it's about. I can say, this post is about an article or a book or an event or a local business. And then I can fill in the relevant detail, who was the author, what was the time, etc. That gets you quick, tangible wins like these kinds of experiences. That's pretty cool, cards, tools, and answers in the search results, which not only answer users' questions, but often enable them to do the thing and take action, to listen to the podcast or to deep link into an app or buy the tickets or compare product info. But this is just the obvious easy stuff. And many people are already here and competing. What they're not doing is what's coming next. Think about this. What if, the, what if I want to describe the article I wrote and the event that it's about, which is hosted at a local business, which happens to be a restaurant, a book signing by a chef, for example. How do I describe that rather than just picking something on the page? And what about connecting all the information about that chef to the article and to the event? And is this book any good? What are the reviews like? And who reviewed them? And what are the opening hours of the restaurant? This is hard to describe by just cherry picking bits of schema. To describe all of this effectively, we need to build a connected graph of data and not just to copy paste the bits of schema markup. This is what that starts to look like. On the left, you can see some example schema code and on the right, you can see the graph that produces. This is from classyschema.org, a great tool by Tony, Tony McCreeth, which visualizes schema. You can see this isn't just things on a page. All of these entities are connected. And this is just a recipe and a simplified one of that, greatly simplified but it connects to an article and to a web page and to an organization and to an author and a logo and to other facets. And those entities in turn connect to other things like, like the details of the author and the rest of the website. Imagine how much more dense those relationships would be if we also described the chef, the book, each review, the author of each review, the opening hours of the restaurant, the dishes on their menu. There is schema for all of this. The links into the apps where you can order their food. Remember, Google is using this information to understand, not just to scrape and copy and promote and rank, but truly to understand. And when they can understand, you open up loads of new possibilities. If you take this to extremes, this is a pretty dense network. You might get something that looks more like this. This is the top 2,500 most linked pages on Wikipedia. I'm not saying you need to add thousands of pages. I'm thinking, think of Wikipedia not as pages, but as a collection of authoritative data. These aren't just pages. They are a network of connected data about entities. You can't do this with pages, but you can do it with data about your pages. Remind me what this has to do with expertise, authority, 
and trust. Many of you will be familiar with this research from last year from Ran Fishkin's Spark Toro and the now defunct um, Spark uh, Jump Shot. Um, they collected data on a wide variety of users in multiple ways, which showed that about half of all searches on Google didn't result in a click. And the working theory is that in the majority of cases, that's because their questions had been answered in the search results. That's up year on year on year. This is an increasing trend where people's needs are being met in the search experience. They're not getting as far as clicking on and visiting websites. And that's because increasingly our search results look something like this, not lists of 10 blue links that we have to choose and pick from and go through all that tedious process, not even featured snippets, which are often the incentive for people to adopt schema, but myriad of formats and resources and tools and interactive widgets. The image in the background is an example from Systrix, who recently categorized over 40 different types of search results. And in many of these, Google has extracted the content from the pages they've crawled and presented them in a dedicated format. Critically, Google is only going to be sourcing information and content to populate these from pages it perceives to be expert, authoritative, and trustworthy. And in turn, users are judging these EAT factors of these pages and this content without ever visiting your website. They're making brand decisions in the SERPs based on your trustworthiness. It's not enough just to mark up your product with schema to get featured snippets. You need to be offering up all of your content and everything about your brand and everything you're connected to in a format that Google can understand and utilize and proving that you're good enough to be featured here. And this isn't happening in isolation. This is happening from everything from jobs to recipes to reviews. This is the future of how we search and browse and consume content. If you are not trustworthy enough or expert enough or authority enough, Google will not select your content to feature here. Because when you look at where these kinds of rich listings occur, it's for people who are searching for trust. This is a study from Ahrefs looking at the kind of search terms and the frequent words when these types of rich snippets and experiences occur. These aren't people who are at the, end of the end, at the end of a buying cycle, clicking on add to cart and converting. These are people who don't know what their challenges are, don't know what their options are, and are looking for help. These are scenarios when it is absolutely critical that a site is trustworthy, authoritative, and an expert. This is all happening because the future of the way we interact with search engines isn't going to be typing something into a box and getting 10 blue links. It's for our personal assistance, whether that's a Google search box or my phone or my Amazon Alexa or whatever, to solve our problems. And they will do that by finding high EAT content. And as Google gets better at understanding the web and your content, they can use that information to solve user problems without the friction of traditional search, without the friction of websites and web pages. To do that, they need structured data. They need to truly understand the content. The SEO industry has cottoned on to the fact that good schema markup can get them rich results for certain verticals. They have completely missed the fact that this isn't about clever meta tags and rich results, but it's a shift away from convincing users that your products or services are good and towards feeding Google with structured data about everything on your websites and pages to convince them that you're good. We are no longer marketing to users. We are also marketing to machines. So what do we do? Let's look at some specifics. I had a whole bunch of references to Lily Ray's article, which hasn't been published yet, so we'll skip through those. But when that does go out, go have a read. There's a whole bunch of practical, tactical, specific stuff in there about um, individual bits of schema that you can add, which are really valuable. But in the meantime, we will plow through some easy stuff. Um, you have to have a robust foundation. You can't just copy paste bits of schema and expect this to work. You have to have a structured data graph, which defines the relationships between your content, your website, your web pages, your organization. If you don't do that, then you're stuck just mentioning things which exist on your page. Here's a product. Here's a recipe. Here's an author. That's better than nothing, but you're not building an interconnected web of things that Google can understand. Remember, we're trying to structure our content in the same way that Wikipedia structures their website so that each individual piece strengthens the whole. If you're one of those clever people running WordPress, you can do this bit really easily by just installing Yoast. Yay! If you're not on WordPress, you can go to schemaapp.com and use their system, but you'll need to customize the output a bit. You can technically try and do some of this by hand or by something like Google Tag Manager, but I strongly recommend against that unless you have no other choice. It's extremely hard to build and maintain these kinds of structures when you need to keep it all in sync and connected. Um, if you need some guidance on how to get started on that, I have written thousands of pages of documentation on our approach, some of the mechanisms, some of the foundations. It's all in Yoast's developer portal. 
This is an example of the base script, which forms the foundation of everything else we build. If you want to evolve your own solution, this is where you start. Use this as inspiration for your own approach. Um, if you are one of those clever people who are using Yoast as well as WordPress, you can use our API, um, the documentation's in there as well, to customize or add and extend and connect things into this. It becomes really easy to do things like say, and I want the reviews, and I want the names of the reviews, and I want the star ratings, et cetera. Go, 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 go. You have to represent everything. This is the mission, not just to cherry pick the bits of schema that give you rich results, but to help Google understand the world and the web. So take a look at your content and identify all of the individual pieces. Yeah, I've seen, I've done that on the right. This is a screenshot of an article on Yoast.com and everything that's in a red box is something that I can represent in schema and I can do so in a way that adds value. I can say, here is the logo of the organization. Here is the search tool, here are the breadcrumbs. Here is the date this was published. Here are its tags, here's the author, here's the author bio, all of these things and it's just the tip of the surface. When you look through Google schema documentation, you can see the things you can describe and the specific things they want to re re reward. And some of them are less obvious than others. So many of the content pages you write might be considered to be articles rather than just web pages. And the difference is that an article can have an author and a topic and categories and metadata and a publisher. And including my current favorite, when we talk about EAT and your money, your life sectors, articles can be reviewed by which is something we're looking to add in your SEO, which is really cool. So you can say this was reviewed by an expert. You can represent that article as a thing which sits inside the web page. There's less obvious stuff as well, like the videos, paywalled content, data sets, any information you have in tables and CSVs could be valuable to mark up. And chances are your business has some of this and isn't exposing it. Things like your content and its structure, your organizations and your people, and the metadata on all of those. If you're super clever, you can really wade through schema.org itself and start to try and compete on unique or rarely used data. When you look at where Google are going with this and how they might start to increasingly infringe on the role of the conventional website and to provide their own content and solve problems in situ, one of the things that you can do to compete that they probably can't is provide unique data that they will struggle to access. Things like, um, Lauren talked about it, but if you're talking about people, you can mention their expertise. There are um, um, factors like alumni of, um, knows about, has skills, those kinds of information, has credentials, job title. You can reference their other bios on their professional networking sites with the same as markup. You can even go further and say their height, their parents, their expertise, their affiliation. There are so many things here that nobody is taking advantage of that you might uniquely have access to. I don't know if height's the best example, but you get the idea. Um, increasingly, there was support for specific subtypes of things, web pages in particular. There was more than one type of web page. It might be an about page or an item page or an FAQ page. I know there's some pending schema stuff for um, terms and conditions pages designed to specifically signpost privacy policies and cookie policies, which when you think about the privacy implications of standardizing that could be a huge deal. An organization might be a museum or a dentist or a store or all three of those things. You want to be really clever. Things can have multiple properties. Quite often, you might find that an article might be published by a person who also represents an organization, or a web page might be an item page and a collection page. You can mush all these things together and use compound typing. An organization might have founded something. It might be a member of um, a professional body. All of these things nobody is using because Google isn't yet giving them shiny featured snippets. You want to compete and get there first. The people who input 90% of the resource on writing and managing schema.org are Google. All of this is here for a reason. Whilst there's not any explicit obvious value to some of them, it's worth considering the opportunity. Thinking of which, this is a screenshot from pending.schema.org, which lists properties which are planned for future support. I, I'm not kidding, all of the resource which goes into managing schema.org as a website, its content, defining and proposing new schema ideas, debating with them on the form, they are all Google employees or two degrees of separation from Google. Now, looking at the screenshot, if I had to guess, I'd expect Google to be making moves on the property market and the health market in the near future. Maybe I in my organization has data which fits these definitions that I can mark up and provide. Now, we know that Google is particularly sensitive when it comes to YMYL categories like health and when ambiguity in content or different content from the norm can cause problems. Maybe marking up your medical claims and statements using this kind of schema and explicitly making those statements might alleviate some of those risks. This is one tiny snapshot of an enormous web page of things which will be coming in the coming months. It's worth spending an hour just going through to look at where is Google thinking strategically, never mind the schema. 
And you can go further than what's just describing what's on your pages. This bit I particularly get excited about because you can connect the topics your content is about to other pages. And maybe if you're really brave, to other websites. You can connect your topics to sites which explore those in more depth than you can, or maybe than you should. You can use same as markup to cross-reference your thing to an authoritative web page. Maybe that might be Wikipedia or the manufacturer of a product or something else entirely. You can say this blue widget is the same thing as that Wikipedia page. Now, in the SEO world, there's often hesitancy around linking out. Why would I endorse another site or risk you click, users clicking out my conversion funnel? We did a really clever thing in Yoast SEO. We ask people to um, link to third party websites in their content, not because it boosts their SEO, but we know that when you are forced to cite external third parties, you write more neutral, impactful, useful content. It forces you to be less self-promotional and forces you to think about other things. In the same way, we can apply that thinking to schema. If I have to cross-reference my entities to other things, I have to think about them more. I have to put more work into describing them. More broadly, I think it's important that we shouldn't think about EAT just as an SEO thing or even a Google thing. I think the reason Google want to promote trustworthy authoritative sources of information is that's what we want as consumers. So the way we think about EAT shouldn't be limited to tactical mindset of looking for specific ways we can get rich snippets. It should be about, about thinking about how we better construct and link our data, including out to the wider web in order to achieve our goals. Because when you're a trusted resource and other people who are being good citizens want to reference other people's entities, they'll reference and link to you. And all of a sudden, we turn all of our websites into something resembling Wikipedia. Now your website and content is a node in a much bigger graph, and you have become an explicit authority on a topic. And all we need to do is link to each other. It's worth considering very briefly while I wrap up that trying to position yourself as an expert on things which you are not an expert in can be harmful. I don't think it's necessary that everybody has 10,000 pages on their website and manages to fully eat them all, whatever that means. I don't think you can be an expert in a thousand things. I don't think an e-commerce store can expertly sell 10,000 different products. I think you can be an expert in 10 things. And maybe your e-commerce store should only sell 100 things. And as long as we continue to stretch ourselves too thin because there's no apparent cost in the digital world because it's all invisible, we will continue to struggle to be experts, authorities, and trustworthy brands and people. I think focusing down on what we're good at and citing external third parties and linking out with schema to other experts is a much better way of thinking about this. Maybe we should think about expertise budget in the same way we think about crawl budget. The last thing you can do is get involved in all of this. All of this is open source. It's all emerging standards, and there are emerging trends and directions, and there are big empty spaces. I showed you the schema pending section, which is just a tiny snapshot of what's coming next, but there are huge areas where you can contribute. There is no way in schema.org to represent animals or plants because nobody's defined it. If you run a pet store and you want to compete and you want to get ahead, spend an hour and start specking it. Get on those forms. I sent shared some links where you can get involved, you can um, come and contribute, you can have discussions. All of these things and standards are open for debate and discussion. And they're just waiting for people like you to wait in. Lastly, the thing I'm most excited about from this, and I think that we all ought to be thinking about, is that having this kind of schema in place allows new systems, services, products, and processes to exist. One of Google's main advantages competitively in the market is it crawls and extracts and understands content from the web. And that makes it very hard for other search engines and other systems to come and take a slice of that pie, to innovate, to move the market forwards. I love Google, but there's space for others. If suddenly we live in a world where I can create a search engine that extracts the opening hours and cuisine type of every restaurant in New York because they've marked it up and it takes two seconds rather than a thousand servers, that enables different new things. I think the more we all collectively invest in this, the more we allow innovation and a creative web. That's exciting. And it also allows us to start thinking beyond just pages. At the moment, we write pages full of content and we bolt on some schema to get some reward. If we start to change that thinking and say, actually, my website and my pages are data sources, databases, nodes in networks. And we think about that as being an equal level of citizenship as being pages that people read content on, then we, en we enable a whole new future of, of the internet to become something much shinier and more exciting. Maybe, hopefully, we'll see. Thank you very much. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, last point was, have Google dug their own grave by allowing or creating or supporting schema markup? 
Oh, interesting. Um, tinfoil hat on for a moment. No, and I don't know whether this is accidental or deliberate, but they've left a little loophole, which means that you know, everyone else will struggle. Um, Google do not support multi-page graphs. They, they have no way of me saying, this is an article written by author John Smith, and that is the profile page of author John Smith over there. I cannot link to another page in Schema and connect those entities other than through same as. Now, it's an there's no reason why Google couldn't do that, except that that's their competitive advantage, because that's what Google does. They uh, grab all the pages and they understand the links and the relationships between them, and they can infer that connection themselves. I tell you, Bing can't, Facebook can't, with, uh, other players can't, uh, certainly not as easily. So there is definitely a competitive advantage in Google tactically not supporting the things it should, but whether that's accidental or not, I don't know. Oh, probably very smart of them. Jolly good. Um, right, I had a question for Lily, because uh, I'm just curious. Can you give us a, a, an overview of this exciting article that everyone's talking <laughs> about that nobody knows about that's coming out tomorrow? <laughs> It's coming out tomorrow, yeah. Um, it's a lot of the, th the same things that John has talked about. So, um, I mean, the fact that it's really underutilized, all these different schema properties that we have available to us, and we're not thinking about all the potential ways that we could be marking up the properties on our page. And not beyond that, we're not even looking at the different things that, that schema.org and Google are suggesting that we add on the page as properties to describe the different entities that we're talking about. So, you know, as, as, as it relates to EAT, things like, if you have person schema on the page, maybe you say like, you know, alumni of, awards that they've won, what credentials do they have? What occupation do they hold? What's their honorary prefix and suffix? Like, I don't know that we think about those things when we create like author bio pages or person pages to begin with, but the fact that they're available in schema means we should probably be using them and including that content on the page. Brilliant. And we've talked a lot through the, the, the whole, all of these three. I mean, what I keep hearing author, author, um, hmm. we're talking about authors. Who's talking about the, the brand, uh, the, the authority and the trustworthiness of the brand? Andrew, I know you, you've thought about this. I mean, we've got author profiles. We've also got about us pages. Go ahead. Oh, about pages is a hobby horse of mine because it's always just a bit of a box tick. So people set up their website and they're so worried about the products and all these kind of things. And they think, oh, we should have an about page. And it's got like three lines on it and maybe a photo of the office dog. And that's about it. It's just such a missed opportunity. There's so many things. I mean, Lily's just kind of touched on it there. There are just hundreds and hundreds of different things you can apply to your about page schema. Um, things in there like, you know, obvious stuff, just like your address, you can mark that up in schema. You can then start to add things in there like what region is your address in? What service area does your address, that's schema as well, you can cover your service area and you can get really like nerdy with this. You don't have to just say, all right, you know, Manhattan. You can draw like a poly polygon in longitude and latitude and mark that up in schema too. Say like, all right, we only serve this little bit of Manhattan, but not this other bit. And you can start to go really to town on the about pages. And, you know, that's, I mean, I think Marie touched on it earlier in the presentation just before this one about, you know, using your about page to get a bit braggy, you know, boast about things like, you know, when you list all your awards, like Jono touched on, like, don't just list all the things you've done and all the coverage you've got and all the, you know, prizes and awards you want, link to them. Like Google's really good at working out what stuff is when you link to it. Don't just say, oh, like, you know, we won this little award and, you know, we don't like to talk about it very much. Here we go. We won this award. Here's the article that we got covered in. Here's the link to it. And blah, blah, blah. this is why we won this award, because we're so great. And here are the things we're really specialist in and mark all that stuff up and just, you know, feed the machine the information that it wants. And, make, you know, schema is not a way to give yourself authority you don't have. But if you do have authority <laughs> and you mark it up, then you're making it easier for Google to work out the stuff you do have. That's a really nice practical point. Um, schema isn't a way to give yourself authority you don't have. Uh, but exactly. one thing that does strike me is you said a word addresses, area served, and so on and so forth. Love it. Jono, isn't that really quickly, this rabbit hole that you go down, you can never get out of because you just give it, oh, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and we never get it done. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, once you've got the framework and that kind of base script approach in, it's trivially complex to add extra things. Um, one of the things that people struggle with and why they get in that rabbit hole is when you're copy pasting bits of this, you get conflicts, you get bits that don't stitch together nicely. You have to do this in a system. I think it's really, really hard to do it outside of that, especially when you're doing things like, I don't know, injecting it via Google Tag Manager. Yeah, as soon when you've got 30 different properties, 50, 100, it's going to start getting messy. If you've got a proper foundation, add a thing, add a thing, add a thing, it's easy. Okay, um, and the the... the... I mean, the thing I'd like to just bring back to you, you showed a slide where you say, here's the instruction manual for schema in Yoast. 
that's a good place to start because somebody was asking that. Where can I start if I don't know anything about schema marketing? Yeah, I will share a link for that. I will paste it into the chat now. And then we'll okay. He says. Brilliant. I'll, I'll do that while you. Oh, I can't. can't what John is doing that I'll, just I'll on, the, on the about page thing, Jason. It's like yep. the, the rabbit hole of like millions and millions of things to add. Like, how often do you change your about page? Maybe when you win a new oh. award, but it's like it's not that often. So yes, fine. It's a rabbit hole to go down and like, oh, we've got to add all these things. But generally, you only do it like once or twice. And I'm not saying like set it and forget it, but do it once well and tweak it every now and then, and you're fine. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm saying. Oh, it's a rabbit hole. And you're saying sit down, do it properly, and it's it's once for a long, long time with little tweaks to come down the line. Exactly. Yeah, Lily. If, what what advice have you got about about pages now that we've talked about authors and content? So this actually relates to our previous webinar, Jason, where we talked about the knowledge graph. Um, there's an opportunity to disambiguate yourself as either an individual or an organization using your about page and using organizational schema. So another thing that I'll mention in the article is the fact that you can use same as to link to other places where your brand has been listed online. Now, Google has deprecated apparently same as uh, for social media uh, websites, but I talked to Jonah about this and we agree you should probably still do it anyway. You know, Google's not the only search engine, but beyond that, you can actually link to your knowledge graph URL, assuming that mm -hmm. you have one. And that's a nice way to disambiguate your brand or yourself from other people that might share that same name. So uh, you're saying getting into the knowledge graph would be a really good idea because then you can identify terribly explicitly who you are and then link everything onto that. Yep, that's the idea. Okay, and you got yourself knowledge in the knowledge graph, the knowledge panel? I did, and I'm competing with another Lily Ray who's also an electronic oh, wow. music musician. So this is why I recommend doing this because uh, I have added some same as links to my own schema and I've seen success with it. So maybe it works. And, and that is a very interesting point because it's it's disambiguation about which Lily, Lily Ray, sorry, we're talking about. And people's names, I mean, there are two things. Jonah, maybe you've got something to say about this, is brands tend to be relatively unambiguous by industry and by country because of copyright trademark laws, whatever, I can't remember which one it is. People tend to be terribly ambiguous. Uh, how can you deal with that? Yeah, and they also don't conveniently often have a website where they live at in the same way that an organization does. Like I'm split across my Twitter. My, I, I happen to have a personal website. Many people don't. When an entity doesn't have somewhere that it lives, that makes that even harder. Um, the answer as to how you do that is you same as it in every direction across all of those things. You say this Twitter profile is the same as that Crunchbase profile, is the same as that LinkedIn, and you build all these little networks across and between the sites. Okay, I mean, you have JonahAlderson.com. I was talking to Paul Lovell earlier on, who was, I mean, I, 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 actually, I was looking about, I was looking up his brand set. He doesn't appear to have a personal website. Would you suggest that that's something we should be doing? Yeah, even just more outside of this context, it's worth doing. I think um, there's a number of different ways that the world might unfold in the next few years. But one of the things that certainly looks to be happening is a, a return to the importance of owned properties. And having your own website where your equity lives that is yours and it doesn't matter what google does or facebook does or twitter does or whatever to change that i think that's valuable anyway uh, lily question for you then i mean I, or, or no in fact andrew is probably because you were talking about about us pages if if i've got my own website or, or, my, or my corporation website it's more than just equity it's controlling the message yeah absolutely um so that kind of boasting about yourself like when you mm. write your about page, you tend to be pretty nice about yourself. Usually you don't mention about like, oh, well, we did have that thing a few years ago where that slightly embarrassing thing happened. <laughs> Nobody does that. So yeah, it is controlling <laughs> that message, but it's like, you know, it's those kind of searches that Jono was talking about earlier where like they're looking for that kind of trust. They probably heard about you a little bit already and they're looking for that kind of, who are these people? Can I trust them? You know, do they have a returns policy? What are their kind of reviews? Are they real specialists in this area or is this a bit of a bolt on for them? They're looking for that kind of information. So if you have an about page that says like, you know, we really nail this thing, we nail this thing and this thing, like rather than the 10,000 things that Jono mentioned in his presentation, like you want to be, really good at 10. These are the 10 things we're really good at. We're blindingly good. We do a few other things too, sure. But these 10 things, these are our things. And that's the kind of confirmation that your users are looking for. It, it, we're return policies. Yeah, certainly. You can, mark, you can mark all that stuff up, schema everything. Just, you know, what you type of 
Yeah, yeah they say question. return policies is something that's actually mentioned in the quality rater guidelines as it relates to EAT and you know how much you trust a brand, especially if you're e-commerce. That's one of the main questions people have when they look up your brand is what's the return policy? So I think that the fact that it exists as a schema property is is pretty clear that it's another hint, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say, Hello, this thing. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that was mentioned in the previous webinar uh, about, um, or maybe the one before, I think it might have been Rodriguez, is people don't, or brands, sorry, don't own the results about themselves. For mm. example, my own return policy and so on and so forth. And kind of Lily, Lily Ray, what do you think about that idea of saying, I need to be the trusted source? And I think trusted is the really important word. That's trusted source for information about me. Well, there's like a lot of different questions that people have about any given brand. And so the nice thing about branded queries is that it's very easy to rank for them on your own website. So um, it's a it's a good practice to kind of go in there and see what people are asking, whether it be internally on your own website or as far as keyword research tools are concerned, maybe there's some information you can get from those. Um, but to have that content available on your website, to use schema to mark it up, um, you know, FAQs and QAs and things like that, um, I think that that's it's crucial. And to your point earlier about should you have a personal website, that's just another way to get your name out there in ranking. And and when people Google you, it's probably going to be your personal website that comes up number one, even if you don't put that much attention into it. So I strongly recommend that if you are someone that cares about your online presence, then you should invest in that as well. Brilliant. Um, Jada, a question for you. Uh, obviously, all of this takes a lot of time, setting all this up, getting a graph going, putting all this information in. And Darren Hung's asking, uh, how can I justify that to the people above me or my clients, that all that time spent when there isn't an obvious immediate return, especially when you're saying, I, for example, this, some of the stuff you're doing is saying, I can't show you a, a rich snippet. I can't show you some fancy stars in the SERP. How can you justify that? Uh, I guess there are two answers to that. One is um, the same way you do all SEO, that this is a proxy for quality and trust. And if you don't do it, it's only a matter of time until either a competitor does it and steals your slot or Google deems it more important and you get knocked down in favor of somebody who's better than you. I think it's the same with everything. Should you should you make your font more readable? Should you improve your accessibility? Should you speed up your website? The answer to all of those is yes. The answer to how much money will it make us is some. And, and that's always going to be the case with all of that. Um, what was the other, what was the second answer? What was that? The second answer is that we know that this is the direction of travel for Google. And chances are, if you're in this webinar, you're ahead of your competitors and you are wanting to be, or at least should be thinking about where you wanna be getting to next. And yes, it will take time to build an internal business case and win hearts and minds, and you will need to convince people to take a leap of faith. And yes, it will take six months to get a development resource in place. By that point, then this might be mainstream and you might be ahead of the game, but everything's a gamble in SEO. Should, should you write another page? Should you delete a page? Should you focus on doing well? You, you do as much of all of it as you can and you hope to make the right decision. I think this is a solid bet and a solid investment. We see so much evidence that Google is obsessed with structured data and not just Google, but other players in the space as well. I think this is the foundation of the future of voice search or personal assistance. This is a smart investment. Yeah, get them to watch this, this webinar. That's how you do it. Brilliant, and listen to you. Um, the, <laughs> if, if we move outside just schema markup and say structured data more than that, HTML5, semantic HTML5 and tables, has anyone got opinions about that? I mean, that's structured data too. We're not using it properly. Andrew, maybe? No, we're not. Oh, uh, sorry, but the question was what, what structured data well, are we not using properly? Yeah, I mean, we've, got, we've talked about schema, we've talked three quarters an hour about schema markup. <laughs> it's not the only structured data out there. We have tables, we have semantic HTML5. How useful is that? So it, the thing I find with schema is that it's like Google is really clever with lots of stuff, right? So if you, you know, you can mark up your tables and things, but then you see that your competitors got an unmarked up table that's just a mash of HTML and it's outranking <laughs> you and it's infuriating. And you think of my beautifully marked up table, why isn't it outranking? Like Google can like join the dots sometimes. Schema is just a good way to make their job easier. Like always the the thing with like crawling and indexing your site, all that kind of stuff, don't make Google work too hard. Like mm -hmm. the, the easier you make it for them, the more simple you go, like this is our address, definitely, definitely this right here in this city, like New York in America, not any other similarly named place nearby. 
you're just making like the kind of disambiguation stuff that Lily was mentioning. Just make it super crystal clear. There's no reason why you wouldn't do that. Why would you not make Google's life easier? Like Google gives you generally for most sites I work on way over 50% of their traffic. So, you know, yeah. why would you not make their life easier? <laughs> okay, um, I did an interview with uh, Fabrice Canal from Bing, who's the boss of Bingbot. Um, Bingbot apparently works pretty much the same as Google. They use the same uh, Chromium basis. Uh, it functions the same. The process is the okay. same. And he was begging people to use tables properly, not to use them for design, use them for data, because that's really confusing. Um, and also using semantic HTML5, even though it doesn't necessarily appear useful, anything that structures in a web page is helpful to Bingbot. And Bingbot pulls it out, sticks it in a database, and labels this stuff. It adds a rich layer of <clears throat> annotation. And the easier you make it, and that's what you just said, make it easy. Make it easy for them to crawl and understand and extract. A good and way. So one of the things, so the question about making, like pitching it to your boss and stuff, it's like yeah. one of the examples I use is just, you know, Google hates being wrong. So when they see a table and the tables are all really clear, like clearly labeled this row, this column, this means this, means this, means this. And like here are the five best, you know, SEOs called Jono that are based in York. Maybe that wouldn't be a very long list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, they, they, Google, Google can't really get that wrong. So when you feed them data with schema, they can't get it wrong. So when you show them like a product page for a trainer and it's got loads of numbers on it, SKU numbers and product numbers and price numbers and sizes and weights. And, and it's just like, it could be a bit risky where it's like, you know, which one's the price? You know, this one kind of ends dot nine, nine. It could be the price. We're not really sure. Schema just makes it just like, this is it. This one's the price definitely. And this one's the size definitely. And it just, you know, Google hates being wrong. So if you can help them not look stupid, then, then it gives users what they want. Yeah, and there was another question, sorry, to move on to something else, is um, Andrew Martin's asking, what do you suspect the Google will add next or should to their gallery of structured data that enriches the SERP? I mean, obviously, forget enriching the SERP because Jonah's angry with that part. But um, you, you had a slide about that. Can you repeat it? Uh, what, are the, what are they adding at the moment on that page you showed, which is the, the resource, the, the research part, and what do you think they could add? Um, there's a huge amount of stuff going on around properties, buying, selling, renting, demarcating different types of properties and contract agreements. Uh, what was the other one? I've forgotten. Um, it I wasn't animals, if I remember rightly. You were saying no, that's animals the, the sadly exist, missing yeah, one. Just, um, bizarre. Where are we? Where is in here somewhere. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, yeah. Lily Red, have you got have you got any ideas of, of attributes? Well, I was or... just I was just wondering, like, is is it a sign when we start to see Google um, with a lot of pending schema types that they might be trying to create some new type of portal or something in the search results? Like, Great. should the, should the real estate industry be concerned that Google's going to come out with some type of home search feature within the search results? Just saying. Yeah. Um, the other one was health, um, which at least was partly because of all the COVID stuff. But they've launched huge amounts. We've got um, this is um, this this is a thing that may treat a health aspect. This is a thing which gives an overview of a health condition. This is a risk or complication that really nuanced medical information. Which yeah, so if you're looking at VAT and you are a medical site. Mm, you're not going to have any choice. That's exactly um, what I was thinking in terms of the real estate thing because. Um, I personally have speculated that Google's probably going to try to roll out something as it relates to health, like some type of portal where yep. they're all already partnered with the Mayo Clinic. So maybe there's just going to be a future where you log on to the search results and you get your health information directly from Google. So it might be interesting to pay attention to these pending schema types to see if they eventually translate into new SERP features. Yeah, and get, get the jump on it if your business is going to go down the pan because Google is going to walk all over your, your particular area, which is a pity. Mm -hmm. um, Moving on to uh, Glory Ramsey asking for regarding local business dentists, plastic surgeons, med spas, websites, does the type of author schema Lauren talked about uh, for their author's work on that kind of website? He's basically saying, is it worth having an author for a local business website? I would definitely. Works definitely for every content. site, yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah, stuff written by a human is more trustworthy than stuff written by an anonymous outsourced copywriter, for sure. Okay. So I think Marie's talked about this quite a lot, this kind of example of, you know, you get content writers for, I don't know, a dentist's site where they write 500 words on the best, best teeth whitening things. Like, do you trust that content more written by me, some SEO who's trying to get stuff to rank? Or do you trust it more written by a dentist who's got qualifications coming out of their ears, went through med school and has been a dentist practicing for 20, for 20 years in your local area? You trust them. Of course you do. And if they can prove who they are and show their credentials and mark all their stuff up, 
why would they not? They should absolutely smash me out of the water. Yeah, I mean, so basically, I don't write about dentistry, by the way. <laughs> you write about chemistry, if I've understood correctly. <laughs> I used to. I mean, whatever industry in, we now have to prove that we're expert. We have to prove that we're authoritative. And we have to prove we're trustworthy. Um, and in the very first one, I mean, I made the point, and Jonah, you were making that point as well earlier on, um, that Google and Bing are saying, here's the result that we think is the best. We're recommending this. They want to remain or they want to seem expert, authoritative, and trustworthy. And they're basically saying, we need you to be if we're going to present you. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's always been the case to some degree. And even more broadly, all marketing is designed to convince users that you're trustworthy and authoritative, et cetera. But what's happened now is that Google have got explicitly good at understanding the factors that we think make things look authoritative and trustworthy. And now they're acting on our behalf to rule out the things that aren't. I don't think that means anything's radically changed other than that it's harder to cheat. Yeah, okay. The, the, Lily Ray, for you, there's a, a, a good question about it's harder to cheat. I mean, I remember the days when inbound links, spammy text, I mean, let's say it was about counting links and counting words. Sure. EAT makes it impossible to cheat? Not impossible, but it makes it much more difficult, especially on YMYL topics. So you're not going to rank very well if it's impossible to tell who you are for YMYL topics. That's just how it is these days. Why should anybody trust your content if they don't know that it's being written by somebody who's a real expert in that in that field? Um, and I think that that's essentially what um, EAT is trying to accomplish. And I think that's what we can help Google to achieve and the other search engines by using structured data to disambiguate. This is absolutely the expert that's if not writing this content, then at least vouching for this content. So before when we were talking about, you know, does the dentist need to have, you know, their authors marked up? So let's say you're in a situation which many of my clients find themselves in where they have people writing for them that aren't necessarily the most expert people on the staff to write about these topics. Um, that's where things like reviewed by and expert reviewers come in. So, um, you know, if, if you have somebody who just kind of writes the content, but then you have the dentist or you have somebody who's a real expert putting their name behind it, there's actually schema markup to support that, which is reviewed by. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Okay. So, I mean, basically schema markup is going to allow us to big ourselves up and push, out, push forward our uh, great attributes of being authoritative and trustworthy uh, into the future. And it, it's just going to get bigger and bigger, isn't it, Jono? Yeah, and I think I want to echo something that Lauren said towards the end of his conversation, which really stuck with me, which is that when you, so this stuff is hard, it takes time and effort and energy to collect and create and curate all of this information. If you've got authors or products or services, gathering all of the things that can be schemed is going to be an effort, but the process of doing it would improve your content. If rather than just having an author with a name and a photo, if I also say, and they are related to, and they know these things, and here's a link to their high school diploma and their swimming certificate, and a hundred other things, and I'm putting all of that on the page, that's a better page. And actually, one of the main incentives for doing this could well be looking at schema.org as a framework and a template for how to create authoritative expert content. Like once you have all of those things, you, you can't just invent them and pull them out of thin air. A lot of, your authors have to have degrees if you're going to mark up which degrees they have. So by going through this process, you inherently tick all of the boxes. And I think thinking about it like that is really valuable. Yeah, no, I love that idea. Is, is as soon as you start writing schema markup, you immediately start thinking, what am I trying to say? What does this represent? And that little rabbit hole of everything starts joining together. Andrew, you were keen on, on the, or not keen on the rabbit hole, you were saying, just do it. I mean, it's the same with the content. I've got my About Us page and I've done it and it's forever, but also with the content. Once I've done it, I don't need to change it because the content isn't going to fundamentally change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, once you get into the, it's the same with anything. Like, you know, when you first start, you know, going for a run, it's horrible and difficult, right? But then as you get more used to it, then it becomes more natural. So yeah, of course, you know, when you write junk content that's terrible and then you learn about headings and you make all your content better for SEO because you read about this SEO thing called headings and then you start putting that in and then you turn your URLs from junk into lovely, neat, beautifully crawlable URLs. And it's just another thing to learn. So yeah, of course, it's not going to just be as easy as banging out the content like you were last week. But if you can start building this into your processes, and thinking about those things like John said, you don't have to do it with everything. 
start you don't not going to be an expert in 10,000 topics overnight start small start with the stuff you'll really crash out at and nail that and go from there yeah okay i mean sorry you said you don't have to do that with everything which i misunderstood and what Jono seemed to be saying is you have to mark up everything right away or you're dead. Is that more or less? <laughs> that, that, that was, that's frightening me, Jono. Pretty can sure that's what Jono said, right? A ske scheme or die? Yeah, yeah, scheme or die. I'm going to get that out of this teacher. <laughs> um, no, and we, we, we talked about this, I think, briefly the other day, that some schema is better than no schema. But like, if you want to compete on this and you want to take advantage of it and you want to use it as a boilerplate for a framework for, for winning, you have to build a structure. You have to collect all that information. There's no point just doing two or three bits of this and, and thinking that it's done and that you're now an authority. You've got to go into some depth. But yeah, and, and you need the technical okay. foundation to do that. In that case, I've got a question, please. Um, for Jono, sorry. And this is just for me. Um, if I put on in place my schema markup that isn't absolutely perfect today and isn't 100% complete, uh, and then kind of a year down the line, I kind of think, oh, okay, I'm going to get Jono's groovy graph going. Um, is that a problem if I express it one way today and then express it a different way tomorrow? No, changing the structures and formats aren't a problem. There's you can you can describe schema in a thousand different ways technically. Um, some are more robust than others. Some are easier to work with than others. Um, I think the graph approach that we use is the best overall approach, but other people have different opinions. Um, I think the risk is um, having stuff that is wrong or incorrect out there, um, not least of which because if Google thinks you're doing that maliciously, i.e. misrepresenting a review or an aspect of your organization, you risk being um, losing the privileges of having rich snippets and potentially even manual warnings and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, if, if you just want to do a little bit and get started, that's fine. I would recommend at the very least describing the organization, the website and the web page and the relationship between those. That's essentially what our base graph does and then bolting other stuff on. But if, you, if you're nervous or don't have the resource to go beyond that yet, then that's fine. That's enough. Okay, so you can you can start small and you can approach it in the wrong manner as long as you don't lie, as long as you're not cheating. If you can approach it wrong and then roll it back and start again with a different system if yep. it comes down to that. Yeah, for sure. Brilliant stuff. Okay. Um, I was trying to say, I, I had another question for Lily and I've completely forgotten it. Um, oh, it was to do with cheating. That was it. Um, Great. Right. Well, I mean, the, the idea that with all the Google penalties in the past, I was talking to Philly Viesa, I think it is, uh, who's talking about Google penalties, and he said Google doesn't hold a grudge. Do you think in EAT that might turn out to be different, that if you start cheating on your EAT, you try and convince Google that you're trustworthy or not? Do you think it's going to get sulky and hold a grudge against you? I think it works differently. I think if you've been established as somebody that's trustworthy as a person or as a brand, it can be very hard to recover from that. And I think we've seen a lot of sites that are making a lot of tweaks to their content and trying to implement EAT best practices when their site or the person behind their site has a fundamentally bad reputation. And I think that can be very difficult to recover from. And the site that I'm thinking of in question has not recovered and it's been two years. So it's, it's a new challenge, I think. Brilliant. Okay, so we can end this this particular chunk of the webinar with Google is starting to sulk. Don't cheat because it will sulk with you and you won't recover. Uh, thank you very much, Jono. I don't think that was repetitive on what was came before. I think you did an amazing job of you, the Wikipedia example is amazing and it's terribly visual and terribly easy for us to digest and get a grip on and aim towards even if we can't do it today. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your input and Lily. That was wonderful. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll see you all soon. That was absolutely amazing. And we're now moving into the fourth hour of this mega webinar about EAT. Some people said you won't have enough to talk about for four hours. And we have had enough and we haven't come close to coming to the end. We've got one hour left with Andrea Volpini, Nick Ranger, and Dave Davis, who isn't here yet. And I'm going to pass over to Nick because my voice is breaking and she's the host <laughs> and can now say goodbye to Joan O'Lilly and Andrew and hello to Andrea. Bye, guys. Thanks. Ciao. Thanks so much, guys. That was absolutely awesome. So now I'm taking over um, the hosting uh, role. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, I don't know. Whoever said that um, we would be struggling to find things to talk about at the four hour mark <laughs> doesn't know anything. <laughs> so if you're just tuning in now, um, we are going on to the, the, last, so the last quarter of the four hours of SEO on SEMrush. Um, if you're watching, you really like this, please smash that like button, um, subscribe to SEMrush, and of course, hit that notification bell 
um, to get all the latest updates with new webinars coming on board.